we go. One, two. One, two. No. One, two. Oh, there you go. Can everybody hear? Okay. Well, welcome to a uh, rainy chamber day in Fairfield. Uh, sorry about the weather, Governor, uh, but we're glad you could make it here to Fairfield this afternoon. Uh, at this time, I would like to introduce uh, a Fairfield man who uh, happens to work for you, Governor, and uh, he's been our adjutant general for some time now, and we're pleased to have him back in Fairfield, Major General Lawson. General Lawson? Governor Brandstad, Mayor Rasmussen, a lot of friends here, fellow guardsmen, ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you that I am overjoyed to join you down here on the occasion of your salute to our governor. As a matter of fact, it's rather tragic that the weather is as it is and that we're not up in Central Park and have a crowd of thousands because that's the kind of salute that our governor richly deserves. You know, I left Fairfield, I guess, to go to college in 1951. And uh, Bobby and I have been gone since that time. And to be invited down to participate and have the opportunity to salute our Commander in Chief really warmed me. Fairfield has been and will always be my hometown. And as a matter of fact, uh, I told Bobby today that. It's like that Vietnam song that I recall hearing when I was stationed there. The old hometown looks the same when I step down from the train. And indeed it does. And as a matter of fact, to have the opportunity to say things on behalf of the Guard at your salute makes it a a very special opportunity. Our governor deserves every bit of credit and every bit of praise that we could heap upon him. You know, he's the longest serving governor in the history of the state of Iowa. He's the longest serving governor currently in our nation. He's served as a chairperson, the president of the National Governors Association, and when you have been elected by your peers, Lord knows he's a leader among leaders, a giant of a leader, and he's also our commander in chief. And I will tell you that in my entire time as the adjutant general, you could always depend on Governor Branstad to support the guard. He supported us in Honduras when there was the Training was unpopular down there, but he went to the mat for us and kept us training there. He supported us on Desert Shield, Desert Storm. He supported us on our deployments to Bosnia and, more, and Panama, Korea, Japan, uh, the current deployments to Kuwait with our Air National Guard and flying out of Turkey with their Air National Guard. As a matter of fact, he's helped us rebuild our infrastructure in the state of Iowa and work is currently going on on your own armory as a function of his support. We built more armories on the tenure of Governor Terry Branstad than have been built in the history of the National Guard in Iowa. We have rebuilt our air bases and we've rebuilt Camp Dodge. And it's that kind of support that sets us apart from other states. As a matter of fact, our state headquarters 
the headquarters of the statewide fiber optic network, the emergency response center for state government, the headquarters of our National Guard. He is the premier headquarters in the entire country. And technologically, with that fiber optic network, Iowa leads the nation. And as a matter of fact, the Guard is now working to get a test bed for a global space simulation center where we will do distributed simulations. And as a function of that network, we probably will succeed at that to add more credit to Iowa. You know, there is really three people and three reasons that you bring people together in groups. One is to recognize events that have occurred and to applaud them or to deplore them. A second is to recognize events that have not occurred and attempt to preclude them from happening. And third is to take and applaud anyone who has been involved in either of the other two. And today, we are doing that third event. We are applauding Governor Branstead for the many things that he has caused to occur in Iowa. We also applaud him for the many things that he has prevented from occurring that were the things that we wanted him to do. On the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier, there is an inscription on the side of that tomb that reads like this, not for fame nor reward, not for special favor, not for glory, nor goaded by ambition, but in simple obedience to these duties, these soldiers did their duty and died. I would use that to paraphrase our governor. Not for fame nor reward. Not for special favor. Not for glory or goaded by ambition. But in simple obedience to his duty as, as he saw that he for, performed them selflessly for over 16 years as our governor and did it in a way to bring prosperity and pride to our state and its peoples. As a matter of fact, it could not have been done better. I once heard the president of Coca-Cola Company say he has had a successful life who has left the world in a better place than he found it. Terry Branstad leaves Iowa in a much better place than he found it. His fingerprints will exist in the history of our state hereafter. And as a matter of fact, the image of him is etched in our minds in a way that we will forever remember our governor. And on occasions such as this, the most important thing that you can do when you attempt to salute one like Governor Branstad is to be there with your presence. But I ask you that you would join me in applauding him generously for the job that he has done for the whole time that he has been our governor. Please stand and get, join me in that regard. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, General, and uh, it's always a pleasure to have you back in Fairfield. This time, it's my pleasure to uh, introduce, I think, the uh, longest standing mayor in the state of Iowa. And that's our one and only Mayor Robert Rasmussen. Mayor Rasmussen. <clears throat> Governor Branstad and General Lawson, 
On behalf of all the people of Jefferson County and of Fairfield, we too want to take just a few moments here to recognize and to appreciate the work you've done for the state of Iowa over these past 16 years. Uh, I am one person who can say I've been elected longer than you have, Governor, but I don't know whether that's always uh, something that to be overly proud of, but I think the fact that I can truly appreciate the changes that have taken place both in state government and local government and the federal government as you look back over these 16 years, I'd like to say we sort of went from typewriters to computers and uh, all that happened while we were trying to do the job and I know while you were trying to do the job for the state of Iowa. Those of us in Fairfield certainly and in Jefferson County feel that we've been one of your cities who are truly rural but have still, and not near a metropolitan area, but still be able to boast of the fact that we have increased our population, we have continued to grow industrially and commercially here in this city, which not all counties, as you know, in the rural area can say this, but we've done our job uh, thanks to the policies and the work that you've done here. Now, as a token of recognition here, I would at least like to, to present you with a, you know, we always get accused of, um, kissing babies and digging uh, shovels and cutting ribbons and those kind of things. So why wouldn't it be appropriate today that I present to you the key to the city of Fairfield? This is a key that I had molded years and years ago at Fairfield Aluminum Company. Uh, it's sort of a key that I give to special people who I feel have uh, earned that recognition, have made a contribution both on their own and to the city of Fairfield and at this time on behalf of the people of Fairfield, I would like to present you a key to the city of Fairfield and say thank you and welcome to our community again. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, the governor of the state of Iowa, Governor Terry Branstad. He has something else on the program, Bob? Or no, that's all right. I don't want to break up your plan here. Well, I have a formal introduction, uh, as the governor always has, but you know, it's been my pleasure over the years to introduce the governor uh, at various times uh, and, and it's always a pleasure and I usually get these formal introductions and I kind of throw them away because uh, everybody's heard what the formal introduction says anyway. Uh, but this one starts out almost 16 years ago the people of Iowa elected a young man named Terry Branstad to the highest office in the state. And I just wanted to throw in here that about 16 years ago is the first time I met the governor. Uh, he may not remember this but uh, we were at an ice cream social here in Fairfield at the Edeker House, uh, and they no longer live here. But uh, when I met uh, the governor at that time, I thought, gee, maybe he'll be around for one term or maybe two. Uh, and gee, you've done a lot better than that. <laughs> so uh, I uh, just want to say welcome to uh, Fairfield. You are the most senior governor in the United States and we welcome you back to Fairfield, and uh, you may have the microphone now, Governor. Okay. Thank you. Bob Phipps, thank you for that very nice introduction, and thanks for all that uh, you've done. I work with Bob very closely. He uh, chaired the College Student Aid Commission for many years, and. I know he's now your chamber executive here in Fairfield, and of course I'm looking forward to coming back here for the governor's pheasant hunt in November. So this won't be my last trip to Fairfield as governor, and we're looking forward to that. I want to especially thank uh, Mayor Rasmussen for giving me a key to the city, and it actually has stamped in it City of Fairfield, Iowa, so there's no doubt where this one came from. And made here with the city's name stamped in it, and it's nice to be introduced by somebody that's been mayor longer than I've been governor. <laughs> I'm especially proud to have had the honor of working closely with uh, General Lawson. 
He is a true professional and has done an outstanding job. Uh, he and, and his wife, Bobby, who's here, uh, for the Iowa National Guard. It makes it easy to be Commander in Chief when the Adjutant General has everything lined up and it's all you have to do is approve it and, and whatever. Uh, we are proud of the Iowa National Guard. I believe that we have the finest state National Guard of any state in the country. And I served in the regular Army uh, back during the Vietnam era, but I would put the Iowa National Guard in terms of their professionalism and their readiness and, and their strength up against uh, what the, the regular Army was when I was in there. Uh, and I've been especially proud of the fact that on every mission, whether it was hauling hay during the drought periods in the 80s, and we hauled hay uh, to other states, whether it was during uh, the tornadoes, the floods, the crash of Flight 232 in Sioux City, where the Air Guard handled that rescue mission, whether it was the call-ups we've had, the overseas training, you name it, whatever the mission, including when the city of Des Moines was without water and the Iowa National Guard in a matter of less than half a day put together water stations to deliver water to the whole metropolitan area, which we did uh, without a hitch uh, for that period of a couple of weeks. Uh, I have always been very proud of the Guard, and it's a real privilege and honor for me to have had the opportunity to be uh, not only the governor, but the commander-in-chief of the Guard. I've always said that during times of emergency, when, you, when the governor puts in place uh, um, uh, basically martial law to, uh, to deal with an emergency situation like we did during the flood of 93, things are much more efficient. We could get a lot more done, but that's not the way things work on a regular basis. And, uh, but I, I just want you to know it is critically important that we continue to maintain a strong a national defense in this country. And I think the most efficient and more ec most economical way to do that is to have citizen soldiers like the men and women that serve in the Guard because they have other jobs, they're involved in their community, but they're also on call when we have an emergency in the state of Iowa, like a tornado that hit Washington, Iowa this year, or if there's a need to be called up, uh, be it Bosnia or the um, Operation Desert Storm during the war in the Gulf, you, you know you can count on that, and they've always done an outstanding job. I also want to say that I've enjoyed very much coming to uh, Jefferson County and Fairfield many, many times as governor. Um, when I ran for governor, and I come from a small rural county in northern Iowa, Winnebago County, I promised that I would not forget where I came from and I would stay in touch with the people of all of Iowa's 99 counties. And there's people in this audience that were there and met me, I think, even when I ran for lieutenant governor. Tell me when I ran for lieutenant governor and for governor. And um, we've tried and we've worked hard to try to do that. I said I'd come to every county every year as governor, and, and according to the calculations I've got here, and I think it's an underestimate, we've been here for 22 official visits in the last 16 years. Uh, in Some of those have been for Chamber of Commerce and economic development things. Others have been the school. I also uh, was there to recognize your girls basketball. You notice they won the state basketball tournament the first year that I was governor, 1983. I remember that very well. We've, uh, we've seen a lot of, I've, and I've never missed the girls basketball tournament in 16 years as governor either. That's uh, one of the great things we have going for us in Iowa is young people involved in band and chorus and athletics and class plays as well as academics. Um, I've been here to the Chamber of Commerce uh, uh, breakfast and I've uh, spoken to the Rotary Club and of course uh, I was here on RAGBRAI, some of you may recall. I just remember that was one windy day we had a headwind all the way into Fairfield uh, and I was pretty worn out when we got here. But I uh, have great memories of that. Uh, uh, I was here with the Secretary of Agriculture to deliver water during the drought back in the late 80s. And I've been here uh, for many events, like the 100th anniversary of the Jefferson County Courthouse. Um, and uh, we were here to welcome back the 224th Engineer Battalion after, after the war in the Gulf. That was a great occasion. And as the General pointed out, 
We're improving the guard facilities here in Fairfield. Um, I've been here to visit industries and businesses. Uh, your, um, I've been here for school events uh, at, uh, at uh, Pekin Elementary in Packwood and also to tour crop condition problems in the, a couple years ago when we, when we had problems uh, with, in, with our crops. And of course, we had a value-added agriculture visit here last year. I spoke to the Rotary and visited Radiance Dairy on that occasion. And uh, I see Jerry Main here. I've worked with him and I've worked with others that have served you in the, in the legislature over those many years. And I want to say it, is a, it has been a true honor and privilege to serve Iowa. What makes Iowa such a special place? It's not certainly the good land we have. We have some of the best land in the world. And that's certainly what makes Iowa a productive agricultural state. But even more important than the rich land we have is the people. The friendliness, the caring nature of Iowa people, the hospitality of Iowans, that's what makes Iowa really special. That's why we have, as our slogan on the, on the, on the signs, the welcome signs to Iowa, Iowa, you make me smile. Because what we found is what really brings people back to Iowa is the niceness of the people, the friendliness, the hospitality. And that's why I was really proud when we were recently named the best state in America to raise children. We've got to continue to work to make this an even better place to raise children by keeping the state safe from dr drugs and crime and corruption and keeping it clean and honest and open, which has been our tradition and history here, Another thing I think that's ex extremely important is that we continue to upgrade and improve our education. The fiber optics network, I think, is opening great opportunities for distance learning. I believe that the um, internet and distance learning is going to give us a leg up here in the state of Iowa. But we've got to continue to invest also in our teachers to make sure that we have the best trained and prepared teachers and that the compensation system is adequate to attract and retain quality people to education of our youth, because that is really an important part of our future. We also benefit from the diversity of choices in education, and I want to keep it that way. The mayor mentioned your success in economic development. I, that has been my priority as governor, is to bring more good jobs to Iowa, to see the population of our state grow, and to see better incomes for our citizens. Uh, we came in during the tough times. I'm proud to say that today, not only do we have a record level of employment and only 2.5 percent unemployment, some people would say that we have jobs that can't be filled because we can't find enough people with the skills to fill those jobs, but we also have the largest budget surplus in our state's history, $878 million. So we're positioned to be able to cut taxes further. We've already cut the income tax 10 percent, eliminated the inheritance tax for lineal descendants. This year we eliminated capital gains for the sale of family farms and businesses to lineal descendants. There's no reason if we continue to make the tough decisions to control spending that we can't continue to reduce the tax burden, make Iowa more attractive, like Jim Lightfoot wants to get rid of the tax on Social Security and cut the income tax another 5 percent each year for the next five years. Those are things that are doable. They can be accomplished if we continue to control spending. We can afford to invest more in education, as we've done the last four years, and reduce the tax burden so Iowa is more attractive for the future. So I feel good about being able to turn over the leadership of state government to another governor. I came in when times were tough. I'd like, and I know that we are facing some challenge in farm commodity prices now, but I think Iowa is better diversified and prepared and I believe that the 21st century can be a time of growth and prosperity here in Fairfield, Jefferson County, in the state of Iowa. And I thank you, because if you hadn't supported me at the ballot box all those many times, and I've never lost in Jefferson County, that is, a primary and a general election for lieutenant governor in 78, a general election for governor in 82, 86, 90, and a primary and a general election for governor in 1994. That's seven times I've been on the ballot in Jefferson County, and every time the people of this county have supported me. So I, I say thank you for giving me 
the support and confidence and the opportunity to lead this state uh, to where we are today. I'm proud of it. I think you should be proud of your community of Fairfield and of Jefferson County and how this area is positioned for the future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Governor. Um, this time I would like to thank the other committee members that helped me with today's event, Maxine French, Myron Gukin, and Ron Bauer, who are all here today. And uh, thank you. Uh, you know, Governor, uh, as Commander-in-Chief, we thought maybe you might enjoy your own 34th Army Band here today. They are uh, based here in Fairfield, as you know, and uh, and they we play on a lot of great occasions for us. That's so right. And, and Fairfield doesn't get to hear them play that much anymore. So uh, we thought maybe you would enjoy having the band. And while the band's playing, I know the governor would like to visit with all of you. So uh, we'll make it a casual afternoon. Uh, get up and visit with the governor. Uh, pictures are available if you'd like to take pictures. And uh, if you would do the honor of passing us to Mr. Goodwin, the uh, commander of the band. Okay. And uh, we'll have a little concert. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. You go ahead. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. The 34th Army Band of the Iowa National Guard presents a farewell concert for our governor, Terry Branstad, in recognition of his many years of outstanding service to the state of Iowa. I am Chief Warrant Officer James Goodwin, Bandmaster and Commander of the 34th Army Band. Well, I bid you to please stand and join in singing of our national anthem. Our first selection for you this afternoon is a John Philip Sousa march entitled El Capitan. This march was originally written for an operetta which Sousa wrote, and the march became such a popular part of the operetta that Sousa rewrote it as a separate entity. And Sousa once said that a march should make a man with a wooden leg step out. This one does. <laughs>
Of course, one of Iowa's own famous musicians and composers was Meredith Wilson. And we wouldn't want to have a concert this afternoon about Iowa and about a, another famous Iowan unless we played some music by, from the Music Man. You're going to hear the Wells Fargo wagon, of course, the lovely Till There Was You, and naturally, 76 trombones.
In recent years, John Philip Sousa historians, Keith Bryan and Loris Schissel, who is from Iowa, by the way, have reissued and rescored some of Sousa's famous works and some of Sousa's lesser known works. Uh, here is a piece that uh, was recently rescored, taken from bits of pieces of things that Sousa had written, based on the song Yankee Doodle. And this is called The Fugue on Yankee Doodle. David Holsinger's beautiful arrangement called On an American Spiritual has made its way in just a few years into the hearts of many people. It's based on the song, Were You There? And its three verses musically portray the words, Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Were you there when they nailed him to the cross? And finally, were you there when he rose up from the grave? On an American Spiritual.
In 1991, another Iowa composer, Frank Pearsaw, who as you may remember was director at the University of Iowa for several years, wrote a march dedicated to the Mason City High School Band. Here is the sparkling march called River City March. We're going to play a piece for you now that um, represents an event that happened during World War II. And I want to give you just a little bit of background. On February 3rd, 1943, the SS Dorchester, an American troop transport, sank in the icy waters off the coast of Greenland, the victim of a German U-boat. Of the 904 men aboard, 605 were lost. And among those who perished were four army chaplains, each of a different faith. The testimony of the survivors tells the story best. They said, as overcrowded lifeboats capsized and rafts drifted away and men milled around on the edge of panic, the only fragment of hope came from the four men standing there with their arms locked together. And when their life jackets were gone, they gave away their own. As the survivors ran, swam away, they remember seeing the chaplain standing there and praying. They were praying in words of Latin and Hebrew and English addressed to the same God. This piece called The Light Eternal is based on the well-known hymn, God of Our Fathers, and is a musical representation of that, that event. The Light Eternal by James Swearingen.
We'll conclude our concert today with one that was requested by the governor. Sir, we'd like to thank you, myself, members of the band, for your many years of service to our state. We wish you and your family well in your future endeavors, and we'd like to play this song for you because you asked for it. The Stars and Stripes Forever. Thank you. Thank you all. We appreciate it. Thank you.